Uh, it's October the 27th, 1998. We are uh, interviewing Gerard Kolesky at his home on Evans Street in Bainbridge, Georgia. Uh, Gerard was in the United States Navy during World War II. And uh, Gerard, to give us a little background, tell us where you were during those critical years of 19 December 1941 on into 1942 and why you joined the Navy and some of your training and regarding your your expertise in naval operations. At uh, the time we entered the war in was December the 7th, 1941. I was in my last year of architecture school at Yale University. And after we came back to school from Christmas holidays that December, uh, I had a professor of structural engineering who was a reserve officer in the United States Navy prior to the war he had been in some time. And he suggested to some of us in his class that uh, since we had a background now in architecture and structural design, that we apply to the Navy for a commission uh, as ensigns uh, in the field of, of construction, which in Navy parlance was the Bureau of Yards and Docks commonly called Bew Docks. But uh, when we went down to 90 Church Street, which was headquarters for the 2nd Naval District, uh, and applied, they said, well, first you have to take the physical edu uh, test, and we took the physical exams and, and passed. At that stage, I think, if you were, if you were breathing and warm, like you were in like a porch climber. Anyway, uh, they said we didn't have any room in the Navy for any uh, graduating architects because there were a number of architects available that were already licensed and in practice and we would have to have a license to get into the Bureau of Yards and Docks. So that was out, but they were looking for people with an architectural type background or ge geology background because, uh, map reading and plan reading because uh, they wanted to uh, put them into a school for naval intelligence. Now, at the time we got into the war, naval intelligence was, in the United States Navy, was next to nothing. Uh, about the most information they had on any foreign port was some postcard a guy sent on to his wife six, eight years before. So. We had learned, the Navy had learned, what little intelligence they had came from the British, and the British had already been in the war for, what, three years, I guess, at that time. And they had developed a system of aerial photography and had developed a core of people who were photographic interpreters. and. That was the major source they found for getting intelligence on German troop movements, on their ship movements, on what was going on in their buildings. You could penetrate almost any kind of camouflage. You could hardly camouflage anything from good aerial photographs. And they would fly sorties over the areas that they wanted to keep under surveillance, and they did much better with the aerial camera work than they were able to do by spies and it was much more reliable. So we were going to train our Navy intelligence people that way and they were looking for people to go into that and they wanted somebody with a background that could look at maps, plans, that sort of thing. So they offered us a commission, there were four or five of us I think, and uh, said they'd call on us, uh, call us up. Uh, but they couldn't give us a date because it would depend on when they had an opening for another class in the, in the Navy Intelligence School and we had to go through an officer's candidate school anyway before we could be, actually get the commission. So uh, we went back to school and, and asked our professor, the dean of the school, if we could uh, take our thesis and finish early since we didn't know what 
excuse me, well, we'd be called in two weeks, two months, or when. And, uh, of course, the, the dean, everybody at all the universities, I guess, was being as accommodative as they could under the circumstances with their students uh, who were going to be drafted anyhow if they didn't enter this or that. So they said, yeah, we could do that. So I finished my thesis and uh, got my degree in, uh, I guess it was along about late, late March, early April. And I came home, and when I got back, my father told me, uh, I don't think I'd been in town an hour, and he said, uh, there's a colonel, what was it, I can't remember his name, out at the base, and he's in charge of the construction of this new air base we're building out here, and he wants to see you. And I said, what, what do you want to see me for? And he said, well, I told him you were graduating from architecture school, and he said, when did you get in? I told him, and he said, well, send him to me. And uh, so I went out and saw him, and he hired me on the spot. He didn't know anything about any qualifications at all. But uh, they were just in the process of building the, the barracks and the hangars and laying down the runways on what was, you know, later the, what we always call the air base. And, uh, I went to work for him under the condition that I had no idea how long I would be able to work, that I'd have to leave when I was called up. And he said, I'll take you for whenever I can get you for us. And he was desperate for people. And uh, they were building the barracks, and he gave me a little office, and he said, uh, now I'm going to put you in charge of the construction out there. And he said, we want to move this thing along as fast as we can. Uh, but we want to have some supervision and control over the, over the construction. And I said, all right. So I had them submit to me shop drawings, on, which is a standard procedure in construction work. And I would check the shop drawings, and then if the shop drawings were right, I'd give them back to them and say, build it this way. And that's the way they would follow on the construction. And one day after I'd been there about, I guess, a week or 10 days, I went down on the field to see uh, how the construction on some of the buildings was coming, and I found that, uh, from my point of view, <laughs> there were an awful lot of mistakes being made, and it was unsatisfactory, and it didn't meet what the, the specifications and the drawings called for, so I stopped them. I said, stop, don't go any further, you're going to take out some stuff and redo it. And uh, so I got back up to the, where my shack was, and I hadn't sat down good before the phone rang and it was the colonel. And he said, where have you been? I said, I went down on the, on the field to check the construction and it's not going too hot. And I stopped him. He said, well, for Pete's sake, don't stop them. I said, well, colonel, they were doing it wrong. He said, I don't care what they were doing. If they were getting it up, leave them alone. So we got to finish this thing. You can't go down there. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> he said, oh. I said, if you say so, but I don't, <laughs> I don't like to put my stamp on anything like that. He said, well, you never mind your stamp. said, you just leave them alone. <laughs> you check the drawings and prove them. That'll keep you clean. So I stayed out there about, uh, I don't know, a couple of months, I guess, and I got notice in the mail to uh, report uh, to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and of all things, to send a Yale man to Harvard to get officer's training was about the last straw, but I was anything for it, so I went. And I stayed at Harvard for, I don't know, six or eight weeks, I guess, uh, while this, we went through the most. This was in uh, probably the summer of 42? Right. Okay. Right, summer of 42. And, and, but uh, were you a commissioned officer then? No, after I got through with that, that the training at Harvard. Business up at Harvard, after I graduated okay. from Harvard, I was all right. I, they, they accepted me. I'm, yeah, I got a commission then. Okay, the, then the, did you go into uh, Naval Intelligence then? I uh, went to, first to uh, Naval Intelligence School in New York at CCNY, City College of New York, ran, had set up to run for just this sort of thing, uh, for aerial, uh, people going into aerial photography and aerial uh, photograph interpretation. And uh, I spent uh, six weeks, I think it was, at uh, in New York, 
and uh, we became familiar with the aerial cameras, what kind of timing devices they had, what could be done, elevations at which, uh, altitudes at which uh, photography could be run at, or taken at, and produce certain scales depending on the camera lenses and the timing of the thing and then about uh, the landforms. Just a general background, you might say, it was, uh, we knew nothing about cameras, any of us. There were about 30 of us in the class, I guess. And after that, we were sent from, uh, after we finished the six weeks in New York, they sent us down to Washington to uh, the uh, Anacostia Naval Air Station, where we were to take another six weeks of training. But you had had no expertise at all in map reading, anything like that before. But, but the, most of this was in uh, aerial photography. Well, I had had some experience in, in <coughs> you might say, in map reading because part of the architectural program was uh, landforms and surveying and things like that. In fact, I had spent one summer during my architectural uh, years at, at, at Yale. I had spent one summer working for the Connecticut Highway Department as an as a instrument man for surveying up there in the summertime. So I knew something about surveying, but nothing about cameras or aerial photography. I never looked through a stereoscopic lens in my life to try to see the thing in three dimensions, you know, like you can do. Well, did, did they talk to you about what your, what your mission would be or what you were, they were expecting? Now, we're talking about mm -hmm. naval intelligence. Mm -hmm. was, all, was any of this classified or? Yeah, all. You had to be qualified top secret to get into that. Okay. They, and that, that's where they did a background check. They never bothered to check on any of us, I don't think. Up until the time we finished the school in New York. And but while we were at that school, the FBI and whoever else did that sort of thing in those days, uh, you had a thorough check was run on you, unbeknownst to me at the time. I saw it in the file years later. but. Uh, uh, you had to be cleared, what they called uh, top secret clearance, to get in the, that program in Washington. And so we stayed in that program for six weeks, and then we were shipped out overseas uh, to various places. Some, a, a lot of the boys in, in the class with me went to uh, the Pacific because the Navy was much right. more that was prime the the Pacific. Way to do you. Your did you have a choice of where you you went where you know at one time they, later they would say you want to go to the Pacific you want to go to Europe but you went they they, they said yeah. uh, that to us said put out on a piece of paper where you want to go it didn't make a tinker's damn way <laughs> you said you wanted to go you went where they sent you anybody said Alaska wound up in the South Pacific and people didn't want to go to Europe usually wound up in Alaska but. I happened to wind up where I asked to go was the European Theater because that's where the where the Germans were. I guess that's why. Uh, <laughs> is that mainly why you wanted because of the, the well, well it, that, that, that that's why I wanted reason, to go no. there. Why they sent me there had nothing to do with what I wanted. It was that was just a, a farce. But uh, I <laughs> wound up getting the most interesting duty uh, that I could have possibly gotten. I had a wonderful. Uh, experience with it. And the Navy taught me a lot of things and I think one of the main things that they taught me that I found useful was that there are more things in life to be interested in than what you think there are. <laughs> I, I had spent five years studying architecture and I, I thought if I didn't practice architecture I was going to die. That was the only thing in the world that I had any interest in. And they put me into a field in which I had no, I not only I had no interest in it, I didn't even know such a thing existed. And, and that was wonderful. The field being aerial photography and aerial interpretation right. of aerial from, right. from aerial. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time now, had we pretty well perfected the aerial cameras or were they, were they working pretty good? Uh, for a long yeah. time, the aerial cameras weren't anything but an overblown camera. Right. That be stuck out of a window of a bomb. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the cameras were getting better. Sony was doing more development right. on the camera than anybody else for aerial work. Mm -hmm. 
and they had developed some 40 inch lenses that really did some good work from up high. Now this is a, you bring up a point about the, it turned out that photographing for speech intelligence, which I got into, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, I guess now. I was assigned when I got to North Africa to headquarters, uh, what was called Shafe's, Allied Force Headquarters in Algiers. That was General Eisenhower's headquarters. He was in charge. But now you were not in the invasion of North Africa. No, oh, that, that uh, I got there after that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the invasion of North Africa was pretty much a walkover. I mean, they, the Germans didn't have any people over there, and the French were, they, they hated the Germans worse than they hated us, and so they just didn't do anything to stop us. So bear in mind that at the same time, Rommel was uh, confronting Montgomery, the British general over in, this, in uh, Libya, and uh, the, that was that Almain had just the battle at Alamein had been fought, which was kind of a turnaround. And uh, the British were advancing and pushing Ronald back. And he was fully occupied over there, so he wasn't bothered about where we were. We landed in uh, Morocco, in French, what was then French Morocco, and Spanish Morocco, and if then, and Algiers. When at that time, Algiers was a French colony. Uh, so that that invasion was not, you know, was a very simple thing. It wasn't a, a many bloodshed to amount to anything. And, and the Allied Force headquarters were set up in Algiers. And I was attached to Allied Force headquarters planning staff. Uh, we were given the uh, problem of amphibious landings a short time after I got attached to the thing. Hey. Within about three months of the time I got there, I guess, uh, we drove, I, when I say we, I mean the Americans now, uh, drove the American Army Patton, as a matter of fact, was head of the army that was used in North Africa, infantry forces and some tank forces. Uh, but the British came up from the southeast and we pushed from the west. And in about three or four months, we pushed the Germans out of North Africa, out of Tunisia, which was their last stand. And then of course, everybody's attention turned to where do we go next? Because Africa then was clear. We were in charge in Africa. By the way, as a matter of <laughs> amusement, uh, I had uh, the distinct pleasure with a friend of mine of liberating uh, Ronald Schiff <laughs> in Tunis. When Rommel got out, they left in a big hurry. And there was a fellow whose first name was Paul, and I don't remember what his last name was. He was a Maltese. He had been the head meat chef at Maxim's in Paris for years. And before Rommel was sent to, to North Africa to conduct his campaign in the desert down there, he had been in Paris for a time, and he just requisitioned Maxime Chef. He said, I like this fellow's cooking. I'm going to take him with me. So he was he was Rommel Chef the whole time he was down there. But I think they, they, they got in a terrible hurry, and he left Paul behind <laughs> when they got out. And Paul was left in Tunis, and this friend of mine and I, we were coming up right behind the, the army to uh, seize all of naval stuff that they had there and see what information we could get, naval charts and stuff like that that they had and what other things. And, and, and they had left in a big hurry because they left a lot of Volkswagens that were brand new that hadn't even had the wheels put on them down by the dock. So we commandeered a, a Volkswagen 
and we got a hold of Paul. I never would have known who he was, but the fellow I was with was there as an interpreter, and he spoke about eight languages, one of which was French, as fluently as he spoke English. So he hit it all fine with Paul, because Paul was glad to hear somebody talking. Well, he showed us where Ronald's store of where the officers, German officers' wine cellar was, and the, all the brandy, most beautiful brandy you ever saw in your life. And uh, we set up housekeeping for <laughs> till they sent after me to come come back to Algiers with what I had. And, now, but you and well, lasted Tunis about then. a week. You and Tunis then. It was in Tunis then. Right. I would have stayed there if they let me. That fellow Paul, he could he could make the most delicious meal out of spam you ever saw. He could cook anything. He was great. Did he go with you back to or did no, he? No, he. My friend kept him for another week, but he had to let him go. I don't know what ever happened to Paul. And his wife was a marvelous, uh, marvelous baker. She she was with him, and she baked all the cakes and breads and everything. He called her Miss Bread, which might have been a good name for him. Well, did you did you? Get much from from uh, the German when you captured the German stuff, archives and maps. Not that really. Help you any? Not really. The, uh, uh, we they uh, had they had charts of all the waters around, but we did you, did you need? Stuff. Yeah, but you, did you need that later? Did they have charts of Italy? And they did, but we did too. Oh, and yeah, right. actually, the amphibious operations. Uh, which we were assigned to start work on shortly thereafter and they the high command. I think uh, Roosevelt and uh, and Churchill and Stalin all had a meeting in Casablanca. And the Gaul along wasn't the Gaul in on that? It may have been, well anyway. I, I don't uh, know. De Gaul he he was a pain in everybody's side there for a long time. Oh uh, anyway. When you talk of amphibian, this is but uh, Amphibious warfare was just beginning. Right. And did you have a sophisticated landing craft then as they would have well, later the, or was it the they, same thing? The British had been working on them and we had been working on some because uh, everybody in the military on the higher echelons foresaw the day when we were going to have to do something like that because we had no foothold in, in Europe anymore. They had overrun Greece and you and if we were going to ever get back on the on the continent of Europe, we were going to have to do it by going over and, and invading some way over a beach. That's the only way we were going to get in, by, which was the first time we'd been confronted with that sort of a situation. Now, of course, in the Pacific, we had, right. we had uh, some amphibious operations there. Their situation in the Pacific was, was somewhat different from ours. Uh, our problems in Europe were when I, to differentiate them from what problems they had. When they would go to attack, they were attacking islands. They were hopping from one island to another. Surprise was no factor with them. If, if, if our Navy had control of the water and our Air Force could, could keep off the Japanese planes, they could surround the island and bombard the devil out of it for two days and then send their forces in knowing that the defenders on the island had no way to reinforce themselves okay. at all. Whereas our situation, the Germans owned the whole of Europe at that time over as far nearly as Moscow. Anywhere we went, they could reinforce themselves much better than we could because they had rail and truck and roadways and everything else and we were going to have to funnel our stuff across the beach. So. The element of surprise was very important to us, that we not let them know where we were coming and we tried to get a foothold before they could muster enough troops from the inland and move them to throw us back. So our landings in the, in the Mediterranean, and I think uh, Overlord too, I, I wasn't at the one in Normandy, uh, I think they were Theirs too were done at night. We came early, just before daybreak. Our first wave always hit the beach before daylight, which cr created a lot of problems too because <laughs> splashing around the dark out there, you could make a lot of mistakes. But that was one 
one problem that we had. And the other problem that we had was offshore to determine what the offshore configuration of the beach was. How far could you get a landing craft up onto the beach? Or was the darn thing going to, was the beach so shallow that the, and the gradient so slow that it, you know, like you're down at Daytona and some of the beaches on the Atlantic coast, you can walk out for 100 yards out there and you're not even up to your waist. Well, if it was that situation, you're in big trouble. Or, and all the beaches over there mostly had sandbars off of them. Well, if you go to a beach down here on the Gulf, you find sandbars, you know, you can swim out 75 yards and you're on a sandbar, but between the sandbar and the beach, there's a, there's a gully where the water may be 15 feet deep. Well, this was a situation that we had in the Mediterranean. It wouldn't have been so bad if we'd have been on the English Channel on the west coast of France where the tides run 40 to 60 feet of tide that they had, enormous tides. So if you're there, and what they did, of course, in Normandy, to get, they didn't have to bother with the sort of thing I got into of, of determining these gradients because they sent a cam plane over with a camera and take pictures of the, of the land at low tide and then take a picture of it at high tide. And if it was 40 feet difference, they just knew if they went in at high tide, they were going to clear anything that the Germans had done down below. But we couldn't do that. We didn't, we didn't have any tide. The Mediterranean has no tide. I don't think most people know that. It has no tide at all. I mean, no one maybe six, inches. six inches, maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe six inches sometimes. So it doesn't have a wave. You don't have a wave factor then, do you? I do. Oh yeah, you have waves. You have, you have pretty well, good surf. Moon. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you have, you have, you have surf. Mm -hmm. Your your wind waves will create surf. In fact, waves are what we counted on, as it turned out, to try to determine what the bottom was like. Uh, the reason that you need to know what the bottom of the of the beach is like, I don't mean whether it's sand or gravel, you could pretty well know that, but what the gradient, you might say, is, is what kind of landing craft are you going to take on that operation to get your people on shore? Now you have LSTs, which are big 300 and something foot long ships that will carry tanks, which you need generally, uh, they will carry heavy equipment, but they have a draft in the front of about three, a little over three feet, and they have a draft in the rear of a little over nine feet. So it had the bottom of them, so all the landing craft, the bottom sloped like that. So if you try to come in with an LST and you're loaded with people and tanks and stuff like that, and you hit a sandbar with that nine foot rear end, your front end's going to be sticking out over the land side of it. You're going to think, boy, we're home free. You let down the ramp, and off you put the tanks, the vehicles, and the people in 12 feet of water. you got a major disaster on your hands. I mean, you're beat before you ever get to the beach. So you need to know where the sandbars are, and they're almost always sandbars in the Mediterranean off of all of the beaches. And you need to know what the water level is above. And if you've got four feet of water above the sandbar, you can go in with an LCVP or the light craft, landing craft, that a personnel craft like that, and clear the sandbar. But you can't go in with an LST. But there are breaks in the sandbar. Oh, okay. And if you can find a break in the sandbar and you can pinpoint it for the coxswain of the ship, he can take his ship in if you give him a guide, and that's another thing that, that we got into. Uh, he can get through, but you got to know where it is. So it was, it was critical to know where the, where the bars were, where the breaks in the bars were, and what the water level was above the sandbar. So this was one question for which nobody had an answer at that time. And uh, there was a British officer who had been Surveyor General in Ceylon before the war, British officer, who was on our staff, uh, Major Williams, Bill Williams. He and I got to be very close friends. Uh, I was assigned to work with him. 
he had an idea that we might solve the problem of determining the depth and the gradient if waves on the sea, that wave motion, followed the same physical principles that govern wave motion of waves in air or through other gases. And he wanted to see if it did because he said if it does and we can get a measurement on the amplitude of the wave, which is distance from one crest to another. And with the stereo, we can sort of get a fix on the height, how high the wave off is. We might get an idea from that what the periodicity was and therefore what the depth would be. It was a complicated formula, and I've got brought along a manual that's got some because I was going to show it to you after the, this is over because it didn't be interest this people to watch it. Uh, so he and I were given permission to have some pictures flown by the Air, Air Force. The Air Force at that time was not an independent service, it was an arm of the Army, it was Army Air Force. And uh, they had a... The Navy wasn't flying anything like that, they didn't have... The Navy only flew off of carriers and we didn't have any carriers in the okay, Mediterranean right. and they kept them all out there. We, we, they had a few what they called escort carriers, which are small carriers, that came back and forth across the Atlantic with the convoys so that planes could fly off around and around the convoy like our destroyers did in counter-submarine warfare. But that's all that we did with aircraft carriers over there. Otherwise we used land-based aircraft, which generally had a lot bigger, longer range anyhow. But we got some pictures flown for us when we had waves that looked like we could use them, it's a good surf. And we get predictions, weather predictions, on what direction the wind was coming from the meteorological people that we had, and they give us a pretty good idea. And so we flew pictures over some beaches uh, out beyond Buzaria, a little town uh, west of us on the north coast of Africa. And we, after we got the pictures, we would we applied this method of determining the depth of the inshore water. And then we went out there, he and I. We got a jeep and went out there. In those days, I was a pretty good swimmer. And I'd swim out a couple of hundred yards and take a, a rope with me that we tied a knot in every foot and every fathom we put a red rag around it and a rock on the bottom. And I'd swim out there and he, I'd, he'd get a fix on me and he'd move me this way that way. And, I'd let my rope down and pull it up and I'd holler at him what the, what the depth of the water was there. And then he'd say, all right, now swim straight at me. And I'd swim straight at him for a distance and stop and tread water and do it again and do it again and come on in and we'd get a string of soundings on the water. And I'd call them out to him and he would write them down and then we'd move to another location. We spent the better part of a day doing this sort of thing. And then we checked our results of the actual soundings that we'd gotten against what our calculations were from using this wave method, and we found that we were doggone close, amazingly close. It surprised us. So we had a little more confidence, and we tested it two or three times like that. And we were getting pretty good results, but we found out one thing, that you had to have a certain kind of wave motion in order to do it. Uh, just a lot of little waves going from a light wind on the water wouldn't do you any good. It had to be a sort of system of waves that meant that the wind across the water, it had to come from a fairly good fetch of water, and it had to blow in the same direction for, oh, generally 12 or more hours from one way and to get a system of waves going that we could use for our measurements and our calculations. And, of course, once the wave broke, as it came in, you know, a little white caps when they break, breakers they, we call. There was no good for anything inside of that, but we didn't much care about that because once the wave broke, we knew we were in shallow enough water where a man could get on up to the beach if he didn't on, on the same boat. Yeah, but were you, you were checking the beaches on, on, you were not checking the beaches where you were going to land. Oh no, we were in North Africa. We oh, were, you you we were, were trying to get down. We were, we were trying to find out. That's right. We on, wanted on to see Sicily. if, if you, the method, you knew Sicily was coming up. 
Oh yeah, we knew Sicily was coming up. And uh, now, now you didn't have this was before the Navy developed the UDT, the underwater people, that, the frog people. No, we there. had frog people. Well, they they couldn't give you some of this information back to you. They could, but there are two reasons why you don't want to use them. One is if you take a man in daylight, you're going to get seen by the enemy who patrols the beach. And if he doesn't kill you, you're going to take your captive. He'll know damn well you're up to something that you shouldn't be up to. And you, you give away of what was known as compromising the operation. And that you wanted to avoid at all costs. You still wanted that element of surprise. And it was essential. It was absolutely essential in Europe. <laughs> and if you went up that night and did it, and I'll tell you a little later on about an incident where we did this, uh, You go up there at night and do it, and you can't get a fix on where you are. You got the soundings, but you couldn't position them. In other words, I knew there was a line that the guy had swum between the boat and the shore, and he had his soundings recorded. He had a little thing he could ride even underwater with. But if you don't know where the line is, what yeah. good does it do you? I mean, we had 10 of these lines you don't know about. So that's why we didn't want to use we didn't want to. We didn't want to use the frog people, as you call them, for that. You need to, you know, underwater demolition. Uh -huh, right. You know, we, we had them. We okay. had them. You did. In fact, I had some under my charge later. I'll tell you about them in in at Anzio. Uh, but uh, we 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 uh, then had uh, flights run for Sicily for the beaches, and when we ran flights for the beaches. Uh, we used the fastest planes that we had, uh, which was a P-38. We had a few P-38s over there, and we took all the, all the armor off of them and put cameras in. And we had uh, our cameras set usually for a photograph every six seconds or every five seconds if they were low altitude. And the lower altitude that we could get them, the better, but of course you're jeopardizing the pilot and the aircraft both when you come in low. And the pilots didn't want to come down to 5,000 feet and photograph because you're sitting duck. And uh, there was a Polish pilot out there at the Strip in Algiers. He had, after Poland was taken by the Nazis, he had gotten out and got over to England and joined the, the Royal Air Force in England as a pilot. They had about 15 or 20 Polish Flyers. Not all of them were with them, but uh, uh, several were. Fine Polifka. He'd do anything. He'd go anywhere in a P-38 and come back. And I don't know how he did it because he'd get shot up, but he'd get back. And he said, "I'll fly your picture, and I'll fly him from lower than that if you want him." He said, "If you want him down about 300 feet, I'd really rather do that." He said, "I'd rather be down on the deck than up there at 5,000 feet." He said, "I can come in from the blind side, and they won't before they can get on me. I'll be out." And so we set the speed on the cameras up, and he flew some for us that were almost—it was unbelievable. I mean, it was just like you were standing on a tower looking. This was for Sicily. This was for Sicily. Yeah. For Sicily was where we learned. Sicily was the first big combined amphibious operation that there was. And we all, it was a learning experience, as they would say nowadays. And in fact, Sicily was the largest amphibious operation we ever did. It was, in, as far as the initial assault was concerned, we took more troops in on the beach in Sicily and in Salerno and in, in the first wave landing than went in in Norman, hmm. simply because the beaches could be stretched out further, and it was was better. Was more well, what it was a division. If you took in a, a solid division, or a two divisions at one time. Yeah. Well, we took. Well, each, well, each division had a sector yeah. of the beach that was marked out. Now, I went um, this, okay after Sicily. There was Salerno. Right. Now, did this guy? Did this Polish fellow? Did he? Was he at Salerno? And yeah, he was marvelous. We couldn't have done what we did without that guy. He was just amazing. Uh, but Sicily uh, was, as I say, we had American Army, American Navy, and Army Air Force 
We had British Army, we had British Navy, we had British Air Force. We had six organizations that were supposed to mesh together and an amphibious operation is the most complex military right. maneuver you can do. Everything's got to be timed, everything's got to mesh, people have got to be here when they're supposed to be, but if they don't, the people that are here can't get there. And it is a very complicated thing to do. And the beach, if you're ever on one, and I hope you never will be, where they're having an amphibious operation, is absolute chaos. It's just bedlam. Did, did you go? Did you go ashore? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah sure. The uh, we did gunfire support for the Navy. You see, when you land on the beaches for the first six, seven hours, you're on the beach or have started your operation. You have nothing but small arms fire because you can't get anything worthwhile more than a machine gun hardly on the beach in that period of time until you can get your bigger stuff in. During that period, you are totally relying on the Air Force to cover you from up top and not let the enemy planes eat you up. And you are depending on the Navy to use their cruisers and their destroyers to come in as close to the shore as they can and give you gunfire support. So we used the Navy as artillery for the Army until they could get their artillery and their tanks landed and get set up and going. So. Uh, in Sicily, we had a terrible thing, uh, and uh, it later made all the newspapers in the country and created a terrible howl. We shot down about 20% uh, of the 82nd Airborne Division ourselves. Yeah. The Navy did. They were coming, and this is the sort of thing that will happen in, on, a, on an amphibious operation, and especially one that you're bringing off early in the morning or before dawn. They had decided that they, to, to help secure the beach, there were a couple of airfields right behind inland, a short ways, small airfields that could be used that the Germans, or the Italians mostly, had at that time. That we should drop some paratroopers back there and let them take those airfields so we could land some planes back there and get air cover and deny them to the, to the enemy and hold them until our forces from the beach could get back there and connect up with them. Well, it was only maybe five, six miles in. So they were going to make a drop. The 82nd was coming out of Malta. The British had held on to Malta, the island in the middle of the, of the Mediterranean. As small as it was, the British held it all through the whole war. And they had an airstrip that was functional. So we loaded the 82nd Airborne in Malta, and they were flying from there to uh, make this drop. Well, they used, you know, I don't know, DC 10s or just cargo plane type things. And these guys all lined up and then they jump out, you know. But they have no armor. And if they can't fight back, they just have to be escorted. So we had fighter plane escort that was supposed to follow them. This was daylight now. And the escort was to fly what was known as top cover. The, the planes carrying the, the troops, the, the paratroopers, were down, I don't know, probably six to eight thousand feet or lower. And the fighter planes that we had were up here looking out for the Germans. Well the Germans outsmarted us. The Germans were in a cloud bank coming around behind the cloud bank seeing this thing and they send three Messerschmitts down to get on to the to the to our tra transport plane. Well, we got about 15, I don't know what they were flying, or one of our fighter aircraft, up here. And they see these three Messerschmitts come in. And they hollered, boys, there they are, let's go get them. So they dive right in after them and they take off. And here go the three Messerschmitts after one pass at the transport. 
they hauled Fanny up towards Sicily again. With all of our fighter cover up there in hot pursuit. As soon as we got that bunch in hot pursuit of these three planes, the rest of the Messerschmitts that they had back over him behind the cloud bank come out and settle down on our aircraft. All right. They were shooting them up something terrible, so the leader of the transport bunch with the, with the airborne people in it said, every man for himself hit the deck go down low and let's see if we can get to some place where we can land without crashing. There were, I talked to a couple of the, the 82nd Airborne boys after that and they said they were, it was terrible that there were four or five of them dead in front of him and behind him. He was lucky to get out. But the tragedy of the thing was that they were approaching from the sea, headed across the convoy area. They had been told very strictly, do not come over the convoy area. Anything coming over the convoy area can be mistaken for an enemy plane and will be fired on because the Navy takes a very ticklish view of their boats and they don't like people, you know, messing around them like that. So they're going to shoot and they don't ask any questions. Unfortunately, also, a DC-10, which was, I think, the plane we were using to carry those, looks an awful lot like, uh, not a folk of them, uh, Junker. Yeah, Junker. Coming out, over, low over the convoy from the sea, the outboard ships that we had, and we had a lot of APAs there, the, the, the ships that carried the troops, out there, and they each have a Navy crew on them that mans about four anti aircraft guns for protection, government cross, and so on. Well, somebody out there hollers, German planes on the starboard. Everybody swings around, and here they come. Nobody tried to make an identification. I don't think probably they could have identified them if they had, because they'd just been through a school that said, this plane looks like this, and this plane looks, and after they flash them up on the screen, if you've been through one of these things, you, you can't remember which is which or the anyhow. We opened up on them, and they were now flying, they were, they were desperate, they were hunting land, and they weren't 500 feet in the air, and we just started chewing them up, our own people. And before it could, the word could get out to stop them, we shot down about six of our own planes. Well, then, did, did they ever, the Navy went in on Sicily, I mean, that, but that was successful. The failure was the, the paratroopers. They never captured those, those, those airfields. They got some people through. It did turn yeah. out that there wasn't much, the Germans didn't give much of a hoot about those <laughs> place anyway. Well, did the information, the way you, you went in on the tides, the way we described earlier, did that help you at Sicily, or did it help the landing craft? Could you go in with the uh, the LSTs at Sicily, or did you have to? We use? got some in later. They mostly came in later on the APBs. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Most of most well, of them came in off the APAs and and I mean AP. in, 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 uh, in the little what we call full boats and stuff like that, small craft that were hauled over there. The LCVPs and the LSTs and the LCTs and those kind of craft that were 60 but, feet or longer, they could come across the ocean on their own bottom. I mean, they didn't have to be hauled. But the smaller, lighter craft that took infantry troops in, they had to be taken over there and, and put in the water. But, but they were the ones that got, could get across. Yeah, the they, 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 they got across. We, we, we were pretty accurate on them. In fact, we were too accurate, I thought. Uh, and Bill did too, because uh, after that, they said, well, Salerno is where are we going next, and you all do the same thing in Salerno. Okay, Salerno, the whole Italian campaign has been subject to a lot of discussion in history, as you know. Salerno, Salerno? Salerno. Did, uh, you got the troops in all right. And got them across the beach. You got them across the beach. You got them into the beach, and you pushed back the Germans and then you, then things just stopped. And, that, and the Germans started hitting the, the, the we, were, uh, we were slaughtered at Salerno, absolutely slaughtered. We took over 30,000 casualties in the first two days. 
Well, I've always heard that the Navy took a, a pretty good lick. We did. We ran across something we didn't know existed, and it scared the willy out of them. They came out, the Germans came out at Solano with a radio control bomb, and they were flying ten and 12,000 feet over the convoy area and dropping these bombs. Well, normally, a plane, an aircraft bombing at 10,000, 15,000 feet over even a convoy area where the place is full of ships and you got a good chance of hitting them. Uh, you, you rarely ever get hit the target. I mean, that's just too high. These boys were coming in and they were dropping bombs and hitting three out of four ships they were bombing. And I'm telling you, it was it was frightening. It scared the Navy to death. It was a, you could see it was a controlled by something because it had a little red tail. You could see behind it on thing. That was so the guy, the bombardier up there could follow the course of the bomb as it fell and he wouldn't lose sight of it. He was sitting there with a device that he could, a radio device, and the bomb had fins on it. Yeah. Like the tail of the rudder of a ship or the tail of a, of an aircraft. And he could, raise it or lower it, make the bomb go out further, make it drop down straight. It was fantastic. We never saw anything like it. And they, they knocked out about four of our ships in less than no time, and we, we were ready to get the hell out of there. But the Navy like, did stay. The, uh, oh, yeah, we stayed. We had to stay. There was no question about it. That's the way the Philadelphia got, uh, yeah, it was the Philadelphia that got. Um, it's been so long ago, I can't remember the Philadelphia, the Brooklyn. I think it was the Philadelphia that took a bomb right straight through the number two turret. And it went out the bottom. It was an armor piercing bomb that exploded and knocked the ship. It didn't sink the ship. They would manage to tow it back to Malta. But it put it completely out of commission to kill my friend. Your he friend, him, but you wanted to be on that ship. Yeah, that, right? that was the one I wanted. He wanted and he, to. He we, won. And we he, flipped. And he yeah. he got on the ship. He lost. But I mean, he won. And, and, and I would have been right where he was. Now, you was, mentioned you went ashore. Big. When you went ashore, you you directed uh, uh, naval gunfire. That was our yeah, job. Yeah, but you weren't trained on that. You were trained as a. Did, I guess you could. You didn't need any training for it. It's, the reason we did it, the ones of us that there were about six of us that were on this Americans, and there were about five British on the planet staff. The thing was that we had done all the intelligence work on the beaches and behind the beaches. We knew and had pinpointed where every gun emplacement was, where every revetment they had, where every house that probably housed them. 88. Uh, uh, yeah, an 88 or whatever else they had was within 500 yards of the back of the beach or anything. We knew what targets were. and So we were in a better position when we'd see they were telling what you were shooting at. If they were 500 yards short, of the target, we knew what the target was. We talked about mm -hmm. it before. And we'd say, you know, elevate for another 500 feet, and then they'd fire again, and they'd say, you own it, or you got it, or you missed it, or do the left. I mean, we were just, we were the best equipped people because we knew what, what the targets would be. In fact, we had, we had given them maps, detailed maps of the terrain showing where the targets were in relationship to the beach and, and everything, so they would know what they would, and the, uh, the, the chief of naval operations for the job, for the, for the invasion, uh, assigned each one destroyers and the British and people did theirs too. This, this was the, the UN four invasion, Sicily, Salerno, Angio, and Southern France. I didn't go on the beach in southern France. I, I did all the planning with them for southern France, but I was sent for to come back to the States. Uh, but you did, well, you were there at Anzio, which ended up being one of the big fiascos. What yeah. happened there? Was it? Well, I'm not a military man, and I have no business second guessing Mark Clark, but uh, everybody in the military outside of the Fifth Army, who, which was his army, his command, blame Mark Clark for what happened at Solano. They didn't push on. Solano was a situation in which you had a flat plain extending back maybe two, three miles from the beach and then suddenly rising up into the 
foothills of the Apennine Mountains. The Germans were all up in the mountains like that. And they had plenty of reinforcements. They kept them around Naples so they could go any direction they want. They didn't put much resistance on the beach itself. That was just a holding operation as far as the defense was concerned. They, they wanted first to determine where the main assault was coming to be sure it wasn't a feint because the British had given them a feint once or twice in Norway and one place or another. And they wanted to be sure that they sized up the situation correctly before they sent a lot of reinforcements in. But what they strung out along the beach was what they could put in pillboxes and, and, and in places that they could they well, could control and was Anzio similar to that? No, Anzio was 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 somewhat different. The the reason that 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 we took so many casualties was that Mark Clark let them dig in about halfway between the beach and the oh. thing, and by the time they got ready to get up and move again, that gave the Germans a night and part of a day to bring down reinforcements. And they just slaughtered us. I mean, they, it was hell in, in Anzio. I mean, in, in Salerno. Well, it was in Anzio too, but for a different reason. The, the, the Anzio operation was, was a different purpose. Um, we got through uh, Salerno, and as far as the Navy was concerned, we didn't have anything to do right then except the normal routine, you know, patrolling and all like that. We didn't have another amphibious operation on the board. Everybody was looking at the south of France, but we thought we probably would need the north. What the plan was that we'd go through Italy and we would have northern Italy. We'd be up as far as Milan or Venice and like that, and that could give us good air cover for anything we wanted to do along the southern French coast, the Riviera area of France. Well, as it turned out, it, you know, we didn't get up there. I mean, uh, we got bogged down uh, at what the Germans called the Gustav Line, a line that they had built across the, the peninsula. They didn't build it, they fortified it as they went, which was anchored on, uh, really, on Monte Cassino, which you probably have heard of. Monte Cassino was a medieval monastery that they moved the monks out and they moved in, the Germans, and they were relying on, and quite rightly, the fact that we would not bomb it because it was a religious edifice and it was a historic edifice and it was like a hospital. It was supposed to be sacred. But they stayed up there in it and they just they mowed us down. I mean, it was horrible. And uh, we had some French law units up there that we put in the line. And they, uh, they were terrorists. They were wonderful fighting people, but they got mercilessly killed up there, that thing. So the, the, in the wintertime, it went along about December, it was obvious that we not moving ahead like we should. And uh, Churchill, he was pushing to go and invade the Yugoslav coast. He wanted to go across the Adriatic from southern Italy and invade Yugoslavia so that we could get there before the Russians got there. He, he didn't want the Russians to get in before us in that part of in the Balkans. Well, I don't think Mr. Churchill had ever been along the coast of Yugoslavia. He wouldn't even suggest it. You still got trouble. Mountains come down straight like this and dive into the sea, and you couldn't. You a squad of of Germans could have held off the whole division of Americans in that place. So we didn't even nobody in in his right. Well, we've had some pictures from there. Right. Once we saw him, we gave up on that. But things were not going well. And but Anzio was your last real, that's where the you last were really involved. Right, involved. right. Then you were planning on the southern yeah. France. Right. Well, I've got to ask you, you mentioned to me once before that you did get the bronze star. And yeah. we close out, you want to comment on what was that? Was it anything in particular? Or well, Jean is a keeper of all the archives around here, and so she, she, is, she kept this photograph, which, uh, you, you got a camera, you take the photograph? You, you yeah. photograph the photograph. Yeah, can you, can you put that in there? That's a photograph taken in the Pentagon, or no, in the Navy Department, I guess it was, in, in Washington, of, uh, that's the Undersecretary of the Navy, Ralph Boyd, was awarding 
bronze stuff. Oh, you look young back then, Gerard. Woo. They, you got it was, <laughs> and you know that's another thing. A war is a thing for young people. Uh, I was 24 years old when I went over there, and, and I was making decisions about this or that that uh, a lot of people, here's a citation on the thing. And that tells about what I was doing. Well, it, exactly what it, 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 it uh, this is really for what he's just described. He worked tireless, tirelessly and with great ingenuity to determine the underwater beach gradients required for the planning of amphibious assault, assaults. As a result of his excellent judgment and extraordinary ability, a high degree of accuracy was attained which contributed materially to the success of our landing forces. His perseverance, skill, and devotion to duty when keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. <laughs> they get a little flowery. They get carried away with themselves a little bit. But, uh, Gerard, as we close out, is there anything in particular you'd like to add to this? This has been a wonderful afternoon. Uh, I hope our library will always know a little bit more about Salerno and Anzio. I got a couple of funny stories, but I don't know if I want to. One of them I know you wouldn't want to put on the tape. The, uh, the other one. The, uh, but it's, uh, we got the more time. Is that about, that's about what we figured for. It's been about an hour, but we still got tape left. Go ahead and put one of your stories on there. Well, I think the scaredest I was the whole time I was over there was flying back after we did the Anzio thing. Uh, I'd been up uh, in Caserta for that, which is north of Naples at Fifth Army Headquarters. And uh, I was flying back uh, to, to my base, which was at headquarters in Algiers. And uh, at that time, we pretty much had control of the sky. There, there were some German planes with Messerschmitts that come in every now and then for just a nuisance raid to shoot up something, or if they could find a, a gasoline dump you know, somewhere they'd try to bomb that, but we weren't bothered much with it. And I went out to the to the airport in Cappuccino and bummed a ride and went a DC ten back to to uh Tunis. So we we're flying along just I guess we must have been a couple of thousand feet across the Mediterranean. We passed Sicily. And I'm sitting up there on a bunch of mail bags, and uh, there's another uh, army fellow who was with me. He was bumming a ride, too. And uh, he taps me on the shoulder, and I said, What do you want? He said, He's thumbing, just look out the window. Like that. I looked out the window. Wingtip to wingtip with us was an ME 109. He just flying out there just as smooth and nice as anything you ever saw. I won't say what I said. <laughs> <laughs> but this kept on for what seemed like 15 minutes. I know it wasn't more than 30 seconds. And I had a 45 side arm, and I said, I'm going to get the thing out and knock the window out and, and chip the <laughs> If I said, well, you better see the pilot, you know. So I go up to where the pilot is, and they didn't have it. They had a door, but it wasn't closed. They left it open all the time. And he's sitting there just calmly flying along. And I said, do you see what's on your wing out there? And he looked at me, and he looked at me. So I, know. I said, well, for God's sake, take the thing down on the deck. Do something. He said, wait a minute. So he, he just kept flying straight, and he kept talking into in his earphone. He talking in it. So uh, I was about to hit him, and just then the Messerschmitt pulls ahead a little bit and goes up like this. And then when he goes up like this, and we see his underside, there's a great big American star on the underside of the plane. It was a Messerschmitt that they had 
shot down but wasn't badly damaged when Tunis wound up, when we pushed the Germans out of Tunis. We put it back together again, and this guy was test flying for the for, for, for he was one of our pilots, and he was a friend of the guy who was flying our plane, see, and he wanted to tell the guy that was flying the prince when we went that he had these two babes lined up in Algiers for the night, <laughs> and when he got off, he was going to meet him there. <laughs> And then I really felt like shooting him. I mean, I, I had never been through a thing like that. I, I, I was scared than I ever was when the Germans were bombing or shooting or anything. <laughs> I knew I was dead. Well, Gerard, we, we thank you, and uh, I think that'll wind us up. <laughs> that ought to be in the You ready?